All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Nathan Trownick. I'm the Cal FRN uh, Board Vice Chair. To start us off this morning, we'll do call to order. And uh, Sue, if you could take a roll call. Good morning. Paul Troxell? Present. Barry Frazier? Present. Present. Bill Hartley? Present. Heather Hosler? Present. Chief Guerrero? Chief Lowe? Present. John Bradley? Present. Jeff Henner? Tom Bruce? Tony DeVaris? Ferdinand Morales? Michelle Alvarado for Ferdinand. Okay, Michelle, you want to come up to the front? Oh, you're fine. <laughs> Chief Trowner? Still here. Adelina's on. I think Adelina will be joining us shortly. She's going by then. Okay, we have a phone. Great, right, thank you. And thanks to everyone for being here this morning. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone we have a full agenda today. Uh, please hold all public comments until requested later in the meeting. Uh, we're going to move on to item number two, which is approval of the October 2016 meeting minutes. Um, if folks have had the opportunity to read and review, I would entertain a motion to approve. I move to approve. Motion a second. I'll say. Who wants to call that second? I'll call it. All right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. They are approved. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, our first net team who's here with us today. Uh, Adam, who's the regional tribal government liaison. Hey, Adam. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Brian, who's the Director of State Plans. Good morning. Brian, it's glad to have you. Uh, David, who is the Regional Lead. Good morning. And uh, Jeanette, who is the First Met Government Affairs. Good morning. Um, so at this time, I'd like to introduce um, uh, Mitch, who's the Deputy Director at California Governor's Office of Emergency Services. Mitch, you have uh, an introduction for us. Well, thank you. I appreciate uh, that. Uh, um, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, the gentleman to my right, uh, Pat Mellon. And uh, most of you remember are on board of uh, Pat before because he was um, an active member of this pro of uh, the California board uh, since its inception. But uh, we recently selected Pat to join us as the assistant director for public safety communications as part of the governor's office of emergency services. Um, so. We are thrilled to have him on board. Um, he comes to us um, having been an instrumental player in, in LA Ricks um, for five years as executive director there. Um, prior to that, of course, uh, working for the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department for many years with a distinguished career there as well. And then, um, of course, supporting us uh, with Calfern. So, uh, we're just so pleased to, to have him with us and to uh, lead uh, this board in the future uh, and uh, to uh, help us uh, through this process. Um, we know that, uh, you know, state plan is, is uh, going to be coming and once received, um, the evaluation of that plan uh, methodically and deliberate um, is extremely important to the director uh, so that he can make a uh, a solid recommendation uh, to the governor uh, for opt-in, opt-out. So um, we're excited to have uh, Pat doing that, and uh, welcome aboard. Absolutely, and, and I'd like to uh, echo the excitement and congratulations to welcome Pat. In in my experience with him, he is one of uh, one of the most competent and capable people in this field, and to have him uh, still involved and at this level. I think uh, is is really exciting. So we're really happy to have you. Well, thank you, and I'm um, I'm extremely pleased to be here. As I um, as I told you when I thought I was departing in September, 
um, you know, this, uh, this board is a tremendous responsibility to all public safety in the state of California, um, as well as, you know, our, our participation with uh, the, the effort in FirstNet. And I'm, um, you, you have, we now have a big task ahead of us, and I'm thrilled to be here. So thank you. Great. Um, any other discussion on this? If not, we'll, uh, we'll move down to item number four and, and let you get off to a flying start with a first net uh, in California update. Okay. Uh, the first item uh, to bring you up to speed is on, on October the, the 20th, uh, Cal OES submitted a response to proposed rules from the FCC on the procedures for uh, the commission's review of the state opt-out opt -out request um, uh, from the uh, FirstNet radio access network. So if uh, anybody's interested, you know, to the extent that we can, we'll, we'll share that response with you. Um, secondly, is on November the 14th, uh, California released a request for information, an RFI, uh, to, to solicit information pertaining to a viable alternative uh, state deployment of, of a radio access network in California that would tie, with, uh, tie in with FirstNet. And as you can imagine, um, you know, in any kind of a decision process, somebody's got to ask the question, what are the alternatives? And we have to be able to answer that question. So this is, this is to provide us with the basis for that, uh, for that response. Um, uh, responses to the RFI are due on January the 2nd. Um, questions are, are being received right now. As of, as of this morning, we have 36 questions that we need to respond to. And those responses uh, will be released uh, on or before um, uh, December 16th. And then um, if, um, uh, and, you know, just discussions with staff, we will have to evaluate uh, and work with uh, Cal OES procurement if, if uh, we feel that an additional amount of time is necessary for those that are considering responses to our RFI to, to provide their, uh, to, to provide their, their, uh, their documents. So. Well, that's as, as it stands today. A bit, uh, responses are due on uh, January second, but that's the, that needs to be evaluated. Um, we are continuing to carry out outreach and educational efforts. Uh, we're participating in metro engagements in collaboration with FirstNet uh, to provide information to the stakeholders. Um, and you know, we are clearly very interested in participating in in, in all the the uh, outreach uh, efforts that FirstNet has in the state of California. We want to be a part of that, and, and you know, we ask that you continue to keep us uh, in the loop on those. And, and come heck or high water, we're going to be a participant in all those you know, with a presence from, from Cal OES. Um, we are uh, currently working uh, to develop, as, as uh, was uh, said by the Deputy Director, uh, with criteria in an evaluation process. Um, for responses not only to the RFI, but ultimately to the state plan that we received from FirstNet's vendor. Um, I think, you know, one, one point that needs to be brought up, and I had a discussion with the, the leader of the working, leadership of the working group this morning, is FirstNet has asked California to provide a list of prioritization, and they've asked all the states to do this. Um, and the priorities for what's important in some of the Midwestern states uh, are different from those uh, elements that are critical to the Eastern states are different than those that are important in, here in California. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a valid request and I've asked uh, Barry Fraser, who's the head of the working group, to, to work with you to develop a list of priorities. And, and good examples of that is, you know, we've got a big long coastline. Uh, we've got 109 tribal nations that we need to ensure coverage to. Uh, we've got a, a you know an international border with Mexico. We've got primitive areas. We've got rural areas. We've got dense urban areas, and each one of those is going to require some um, you know individual attention. And so I think again, it's a legitimate request from FirstNet that California provide them for some, with some information as to what is important to California, and we will do that. Um, and lastly, um, uh, we are eager to work with FirstNet throughout the, you know, the development of the state plan. We hope it, you know, to the extent that it can, that we can be an active participant rather than waiting until we get the, the final document. Um, and then we will, we will be prepared to launch into an evaluation of the state plan once it's, once it's delivered to us, and, and then ultimately to make a recommendation to the director of Cal OES and then to the, and to the governor. 
Very good, and thank you. Uh, Pat makes mention of a, a, a working group, and if folks will remember back in August, September, we made the decision to establish a working group of board members who uh, have some of the strongest technical background in the issues surrounding FirstNet uh, to really go much deeper into the issues than, than the board has to in the time allotted at our meetings and come back um, with recommendations and also uh, just informational items on things that we should know about as, as we make decisions uh, moving forward. So um, it's great to hear that group engaging again in, in issues as they come down the line. Uh, is there anything for, for Pat uh, from folks on, on this item? Barry. Chief, uh, just uh, following up, up on the working group uh, discussion, uh, uh, those of you who are members of the working group, be prepared because we're going to be, I think, pretty busy over the next uh, few weeks and months. Uh, we will need to uh, uh, first take a quick look at prioritizing what California's needs are, as, as Pat mentioned, and we'll work on that right away to get that out to, to FirstNet as soon as possible. Uh, and then, then we'll look at uh, some other tasks uh, for, for the working group uh, involved with uh, evaluations and, and the RFI and the state plans as they go forward. I ex expect it to be a very busy six or eight months for the, for the working group. So those of you who are on the group, uh, be prepared. <laughs> Notice has been given. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments from the group? All right, not seeing any. Uh, we'll move on to item five. Uh, Mitch, if you can give us a, a fall 2016 SPOC meeting update. Thanks, Chief. I had the pleasure of representing uh, uh, California at the most recent uh, SPOC update meeting and um, affectionately known as SPOC Fest, uh, which I <laughs> was not familiar with that term until I got there. Um, but it was a, a great meeting. Um, Good opportunity to 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 hear from our um, neighbors as well as uh, as to the states and uh, the states of point of contact and then the updates that we received and so uh, FirstNet did a great job of uh, putting that together. Um, obviously, the 800-pound gorilla was everybody was looking forward to coming to this meeting with the knowing who the selection of the um, of the announced uh, selection of our vendor um, that. We had already been put out in advance prior to the meeting that was not going to take place. So we're all anxious to have that uh, uh, notification when it does take place to us and kind of moving forward from it. But um, nobody would like that more than our FirstNet team to my left uh, than, and, and maybe us. So it's really, uh, we're all anxious for it. But a couple of key things that I wanted to bring up uh, to the board uh, that were discussed uh, there that had not been previously covered. Um, one is we had a, a good discussion on the state alternative plan uh, process. Most of the states were still looking for more detail on what does that mean uh, if you're engaged um, or even if you choose to turn in an alternative plan and it's not approved. And what is that going to mean in terms of some real spe specificity to all of us for procedurally uh, times, what happens then. Um, and so there's there's interpretation that we think is, is there, but not, it's not really defined yet in writing, uh, wasn't put out in writing for, for all of that. Um, so I know it's still being worked on, which is a good thing, um, but obviously the sooner the better because you know, as plans were released, um, it's going to set the guidance that's gonna impact all of the states uh, for um, some of the decision making and then procedurally on how to, to do business. So that was uh, pretty important. Um, and then the other thing that was was uh, significant was discussion from uh, uh, Ms. Marsha McBride from NTIA. And one of the key things that, uh, that she briefed was um, if a state does opt out, um, any excess revenues generated um, through the opportunity for that uh, excess capacity that exists out there on the network with, with providers, um, was was in fact going to be used uh, to subsidize the the uh, nationwide build out. So uh, that is a, a significant uh, point that was shared with us, and that would be based off of the lease spectrum agreement that that California would have to um, negotiate uh, from that. So you know, previously there was some discussion on if 
Um, California did do a build out of itself on the RAN, and we sold that excess capacity to the networks that was there that would allow that revenue uh, to be generated and, in fact, could be used to build out our network maybe more robustly uh, or more, uh, uh, more expeditiously because there would be a significant revenue um, piece from us. California, based on its population density, um, could be a cash cow uh, for business model side. But if, in fact, the lease agreement uh, that is going to be negotiated for California is going to charge us significantly more to use the same spectrum, um, then that uh, money won't be there uh, for that opportunity. So it kind of um, negates uh, some of that possibility uh, for us. And I thought it was important that the board be aware of that, um, that that is how that is being viewed from NTIA and how they're moving forward with it. So, um, uh, for it. And then if California, of course, came out with their own proposal and said we wanted to build even further out on the network, um, that was going to be evaluated uh, by this group on the, on the state alternative plan process to determine whether or not we were building too robustly. So you know, maybe we wanted to have a much more expansive, inclusive, and that may not be approved as well. So it's, a, it's an interesting piece uh, to be put in and for all of those discussions that were from it. Um, the answer that was, uh, uh, there were some, some questions and some Q&A that are there. Uh, we do have some uh, meeting minutes that we'll have for the board uh, as part of uh, our update uh, following this, uh, just approved them. And so we'll get those out to you uh, from it. So, and then fundamentally, uh, one of our other states, uh, Kansas, had asked the question, you know, what if a state's alternative plan does not pass their evaluation? So you, you turn in an alternate plan and it doesn't pass it. Um, and the answer that was provided to us that um, if it can't successfully pass FCC review, then the first net plan rules um, based on the interpretation was that the, the law is silent so that it must be determined by NTA and what that's going to mean to all of us. So um, there's, a, there's a few things that are there that um, still need to be worked out. Uh, the other item that, of significance uh, was SLIG P 2.0. Uh, there is a a request for states to voluntarily turn in um, unused uh, SLIGP grants uh, to consolidate them for redistribution um, to those states that choose to opt in uh, to allow continuation of funding of SLIGP uh, to those that uh, have access to it. So um, it's a voluntary request, uh, one uh, that uh, we're looking at and we will, we will evaluate. But a lot of it will be based off of um, input from the board as well to, to Pat on initiatives and things that uh, we need to pursue to determine if that is a, a viable thing that we can make a recommendation to support or not support. Um, but um, it was a, a significant discussion point and one that basically we have some states that have executed and um, used all of their funding and others uh, that may have uh, funding on the on the table when the SLIGP grant is uh, is completed, and we certainly don't want to waste that money if there's an opportunity to to put it back out. But on the same side, uh, you don't want to turn it in if you have initiatives that you want to um, effectively pursue at the state level, and we want to make sure that we meet those uh, for us. Um, additionally, uh, and it's in the folder, and I know I don't want to steal too much from Brian because he's here today, but um, there is a we discussed our the state uh, plan portal um, that will be used to. Uh, distribute the state plans and how it's going to be partitioned uh, to effectively allow um, viewing on, for some areas uh, that will allow us to uh, view um, the plan in open and other areas that can be constrained so that there's confidential information that needs to be shared only with the board or the governor or on those on a need to know that we can um, restrict uh, that portal access in from some areas. So um, I, I think you were I'm going to present some of that today, so I'll we'll let you uh, dive into that a little deeper, Brian. Uh, but it's a good uh, uh, formula and a process from it, and there's a handout in your packet that I noticed that's uh, there that was shared with us from the uh, state point of contact meeting. Um, the, the other piece that uh, does beg the question that goes hand in hand with the what I would consider the, the close objectives that uh, Pat has already mentioned uh, for the board is looking forward um, the question was asked to, to FirstNet, what is their expectation from the states post-opt-in uh, uh, or opt-out, uh, particularly on the opt-in side, 
what happens to the role of the SPOC? What happens to the role of this board? Um, what are the functions that we wish to continue and to proceed on? And so um, I would ask uh, that uh, the board um, start those deliberations and start think thinking through that for ourselves. What is it that we wish to continue to achieve and that continued integration uh, with a selected vendor um, and what is the what is going to take place for, uh, for us uh, on that? Um, there may not be SLIGP grants to support uh, those pieces from us, or we may have some available, but uh, we need to kind of think through um, what that uh, role and that relationship is going to be as we move forward. Um, our discussion on, on priorities for the state, as already mentioned by Pat, I uh, want to endorse that. Uh, obviously, we've turned in everything that we want. So if everything is a priority, then nothing is a priority. Um, so um, our initial hope was that FirstNet would just uh, give us everything we asked for, and then we won't have to worry about it. <laughs> but, but we do uh, certainly want to work where possible uh, to give further analysis and refinement to our priorities. Um, as discussed, uh, and we're looking forward to that, uh, getting greater fidelity for you, um, and hopefully um, everything can be captured and maybe it's uh, in a phased approach uh, to meet all of our objectives as uh, build-out takes place, but we definitely want to make sure that um, they're all addressed and they know what's most important for us and then where we can move and adjust accordingly. And that is it for the update, subject to the questions from the board or any comments uh, from my, my colleagues to the left. Uh, Mitch, for folks watching now or who may watch later that don't know what SLIGP is or what those grants are used for, could you expand on that real quick? Sure. The, the state has a, uh, uh, the state was uh, issued a grant, um, and it's known as SLIGP. Um, it's been in, uh, administered um, and issued to the state of California. Um, it is used to reimburse um, a series of initiatives and uh, items that are all in direct support of FirstNet. Um, and it allowed us to do some of those town halls and the other uh, the consultations, um, many of the things that we, we wish to pursue in those activities. Um, it can be used um, to reimburse um, expenses that are all directly related to the SPOC. Um, so that the states um, have adequate uh, staffing to support uh, the engagement and the travel associated with um, the activities that are from it. So um, like all grants, they have an expiration uh, date. Um, there are some restrictions for what they can and cannot be used. Um, we can go into greater detail on those, or, or Sue can. Uh, she's got some better familiarity than I do on the left and rights for all of them, but um, that's kind of the, the general overview for it. Perfect. Uh, and I think your point is well taken about uh, us starting sooner than later to think about uh, what the roles and responsibilities of the board and such are um, after uh, this first phase is complete. Um, I'm going to turn to to Barry and ask again if the if our if our ever helpful work group would mind uh, brainstorming um, a framework that could be brought for broader discussion to the board, perhaps at our at our next meeting. Uh, well, despite the fact I feel a little bit of piling on going on here, I'm, I'm that's sure. that's really not what's happening. If you feel that way, I'm I, sure. I don't know what's No, saying. no, I'm joking. I'm, 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 I'm sure that we. Um, it is the, the holidays, Barry. So the, the work group. Yeah, I'm, nothing else going on. I'm the right? gift that keeps on giving. Um, but I think the work group would be happy to at least make some initial uh, recommendations or, or uh, goals or objectives, and then bring them back to the yeah. to the board. Sure. I think I think key is just kind of talking about what the board and or other positions look like um, beyond this and then and then letting that group come together and talk about what goals they may have uh, as, as things move on. Are there any other questions um, from Mitch's update from folks or any any add-ons? See none. Item number six is the first net show. <laughs> An update. Who's, who's doing it? Everybody? One? I'll start out. Right. My name is All uh, right. <laughs> first off, I'd like to thank the board for allowing our team to come in here and speak to you today. Um, I'm the newest member of the group. My name is Dave Faulkner. I'm the Region 9 lead. 
which means I cover California, Arizona, and Nevada. I'm based out of Phoenix, Arizona. I come from public safety. I spent 33 years with the Phoenix Police Department and retired about a year and a half ago as a commander. And um, I'm very passionate about looking out for my brothers in fire and police and uh, brothers and sisters. And uh, so when I was given this opportunity, I jumped at it and uh, be on a cutting edge type team like this and looking out for these type of uh, new opportunities for public safety. And I want to be respectful of uh, the board's time and I want to save our time for our presentation. So I'm going to cut myself a little bit short and uh, skip to Brian Hobson, who is going to present the state plan. Great. Thanks, David. <clears throat> and uh, it's good to be back here. Brian Hobson, director of state plans, uh, a resident of California. So it's always good to uh, see the good work that's being done here and the representation by this board. As, as, um, as, as Mitch said, that there, there is a, a, we recently had the, the SPOC meeting. Uh, one of the, the, the key focuses for that meeting was really the state plan preparation. You can see there's a lot of activities going on here uh, related to that. So we wanted to kind of repeat some of the information that we shared at that meeting that I think is absolutely relevant to some of the activities you have planned here, give the opportunity to share that with the entire board uh, and, and those participating remotely. So if we could queue up the slides. While we're waiting that to, for, to be loaded up, um, w one of the key issues, um, I'm sure as, as Mitch alluded to, and then I know that it's been circulating, it is the time frame. Everyone's interested in the schedule, what's going on. Um, I'm sure you've seen some of the news articles. We have acknowledged that there has been a filing uh, with the Federal Court of Claims. Um, we are, have been brought into that to support as part of this acquisition process that's being handled by the Department of Justice. Um, so we're doing everything in our power to support that uh, as appropriate. I think anyone that's been in government acquisition can understand and respect either at you know, state, local, municipal, federal level, that it's critical to, to protect the acquisition integrity, and that's exactly what we're doing. So fortunately, we can't provide any, any more updates than that other than well, I think everyone here is uh, actively looking for that to be awarded um, when possible, but we certainly don't want to sacrifice the integrity of that acquisition. So. We had our dry run that went so well, right? So uh, while we're waiting for that, in, in the folder, as alluded to, there are the, the, the presentation slides that we're going to step through. And there, there's a, a, a good size handout here that's folded in half that we, uh, that we refer to as the, the, the state plan portal site map. And we'll, we'll step through that today. It's a little bit hard to read, but we'll, uh, in, in stepping through that, that is kind of the basis for some of the updates that we gave. Um, and just as we always try to do, try to give an update and share what some of the current thinking is around our activities, where we stand on some of our planning with respect to state plans, and hopefully this can be used as a tool uh, for everyone here to kind of look at, get familiar with, and start to build the processes and identify the people that will be involved in participating um, in, in this important review process once state plans are delivered. So it looks like we're up and running. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you. So just a brief update and just recapping um, information that we've shared in the past. Uh, as I think we all know that the state plan template, as we called it, that was included in the RFP was built upon many, many, many inputs that we received during our consultation phases as we led up to the release of our acquisition in the RFP. Um, it, it, we, it was really driven by the types of information that would be needed to be included for any type of opt-out evaluation. Uh, and it was also largely uh, inclusive of the inputs that we gathered through consultation of, of, frankly, the information that stakeholders wanted to see in the state plan to really have an understanding, build up that level of confidence that you could, based on the information in the state plan, give a recommendation to the governor, make an informed recommendation to the governor. And so that has really been a driving factor behind that state plan. We also learned through consultation that because of the information, the types of information, the significance of the information, the different stakeholder perspectives, that delivering that in an online portal seemed to be the best avenue for, for delivering that information, for consumption of that information. And that was the objective that we set in the RFP. So two key elements, key two documents in the RFP were attachments J19 and J18. 
One stated the objectives for this state plan portal called the state plan delivery mechanism. The other was the state plan template, which is really the content we identified to be included in a portal. So how could that content identified in that template be integrated into a web-based portal to deliver that information? It is not necessarily a template, a Word document template type that we would intend to just fill out, populate, and, and make available through a portal for, say, download. Perfect example we always use is coverage maps. That with coverage, we know there's a lot of stakeholder needs that showing a coverage map on a piece of paper for the state of California may not serve everyone that well, that you'd really want to drill down, take a look at the areas of interest, your operational areas of interest, and see what that coverage looks like um, and, the, and the areas that mean the most to you. So that's exactly the types of, uh, the, the reason that we want to make sure this information is developed or delivered in a portal, a web-based portal, interactive portal, as opposed to a, a, a paper document. So as we, as we continue to engage stakeholders and, and understanding that there's really two different perspectives of the people that have in, uh, um, are in, interested in learning about the state plan and, and what the first net proposed solution is gonna look like. And that is those that are gonna be involved in this process, like many of us here, um, or many of you here, that will, will really be looking at this from the, the standpoint of helping to make a recommendation to the governor of who is going to deploy the RAN in the state of California. And those that are looking at it from that perspective and want to understand that type of information, in some cases it's very unique, that is really the information that's geared towards that right side of the portal. This is very notional, obviously, but those that are, need that kind of controlled access, sense of information, that's the audience. We, we refer to that as the governor side of the portal or the controlled access, the protected side, uh, to, to have any type of sensitive information and share that with those that really need to know. The other side of it is, is really geared towards that very broad public safety audience, those that want to know what the first net proposed solution would look like in the state and want to know to inf look at it from a perspective of adoption. Are they going to want to adopt first nest service when it becomes available? So very common questions I'm sure you all hear. How much is it going to cost? Where is coverage going to be? What types of devices do we have? Um, what types of service plans are there? Uh, what does it look like? What types of service offerings are there? All that information we want to put in that public side of the portal because that's the audience that's targeted to. And that's wide open. Uh, we don't expect to have the, any type of protection on that information. So. When understanding the, the state plan that would be delivered and kind of the perspectives, it's really important to understand the audience. Uh, and that will drive, uh, I think, the information that they're interested in and how you form the teams and, and where information can be accessed uh, in this process. So as, as I alluded to a little bit, that public side of the portal, these are just some examples that we show uh, that you could find um, on, on that side. And again, just examples. This is not an all-inclusive list by any means, but we want to kind of give a representation of the types of things you could expect to see. And we fully expect that that public side of the portal will have a great deal of information, that it should actually satisfy a significant number of stakeholders' interests when looking at the type of information in the state plan. But as I mentioned, we have that governor side of the portal. For, so for those of you that will be involved in that process, really doing a deep dive and evaluating this to make that informed decision, we have really focused a lot of our efforts and started to proactively look at how would we organize this information in a constructive way and present it to, to you to allow you to, to gain that information, make those decisions, and allow people to kind of dig in and look at the areas that are of interest to them. And I know this is very detailed and we'll step through it at a high level, but the one thing I definitely wanted to point out is this is very notional. This is our information it's our, our approach, our perspectives, independent of any, anything going on with the acquisition. We wanted to make sure we're very proactive in working on this going into it so that we're prepared, we have our ideas documented, but we know that anyone who's bidding on this very, may very likely have their approach that may differ from this. And so as we roll this state plan out, it's, it's very likely that the, the final portal will differ from this, but we certainly think these categories, the general information, will definitely uh, sustain. So just wanted to point that out, that when we get to those evolutions and you start to see a, a release of the portal, that it may not be, be laid out exactly like this. So looking at this, this portal, these blue boxes, this is kind of what we, how we'd organize, we propose to organize this as, as a site map. And you commonly see on websites, they'll have a site map that kind of shows you the broad picture 
of how information is organized. And this is exactly what we intended to do. And the blue boxes represent notionally where you would have web pages and how they could be organized. And all of those bullets underneath reflect very specific kind of data elements or more specific information um, for each box. Brian, sorry to interrupt, but in, the, in your folders, you should be able to see this. I just want to make sure everybody has this. To view. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. It's a little easier to see in, in uh, close up. So, so that is kind of how we've taken that, if you think about that state plan template that was in the RFP, reformatted that and kind of looked at and reorganized it to some extent, but just how does this shape up in a web-based portal? So the content really, we didn't change up the content necessarily, it's just how it's reorganized can be structured. Looking at this at a high level, it can be broken down into about five different categories. But at the highest level, we, we refer to this as our landing page. And that's really, when you first log in, the concept is we want to make sure this is tailored and customized to the, the relevant points in that state plan that we've heard are important to California. And that is why we're asking for kind of what is most important what are those priorities? What are those things that California really wants to see in a state plan? What are, what's important to your stakeholders? Barry gave some great examples of, of uh, or I'm sorry, Pat gave some great examples of, of border coverage, tribal lands, coastline, all those types of things, uh, rural areas. That's exactly the type of thing that if you identify that, that helps both all of us involved in this process really understand what's important so we can make sure that state plan is customized and tailored to those things that matter most in the state. And that's, ex that's exactly how we would expect to kind of tailor that and set it up to, to support those types of areas of interest. So looking at this at those kind of general categories and how this is laid out and organized. First and foremost, we know that not everyone that will be involved in this process in reviewing a state plan We'll have had background in, in what FirstNet is, what our acquisition process is, what the state plan is, how those are related and tied together. What is this ultimate decision that we're getting towards? So we want to provide that background so those that aren't as familiar can, can gain access to that information. The second area is consultation. And, and, uh, and many of you know that we've gone through this process uh, between FirstNet and each state and territory having ongoing dialogues, many ways that we've done consultation. And we want to make sure that we show that information, it's reflected back. All of those inputs we learned from you through this consultation process are reflected back and included in that consultation area. So everything from, from data collection to, to submissions to the public notices or the acquisition process, all of that information we intend to include and identify and reflect back at a high level view uh, in that consultation page to really capture what we learned. The third section and probably one of the more detailed sections is the RAN deployment. We know this is uh, the radio access network. What does the coverage look like in the state? Um, we know there's a lot of information that commonly coverage is one of the, the top main topics that people are interested in. Um, how much coverage, how quickly we're gonna get it, how much capacity will that coverage provide? Those are the types of key questions that we wanna make sure are highlighted in that RAN deployment as well as, again, some of this very specific information unique to this and how did we plan that coverage? What type of modeling went into it? Some of those very specific areas of interest that we know some of the more technical focus experts will want to see and understand. The next main category are just generally first net operations and network policies. So, in our interpretations and the way the law was written, the FirstNet is responsible for deploying the nationwide core to ensure interoperability, and the service is offered with that. We know cybersecurity is an important element for this network deployment, and so ensuring there are a minimum set of cybersecurity requirements uh, in the network to ensure that level of compliance across the network, also very important. So these types of key elements um, will be provided not only for your information and awareness, but also for any types of policies that an opt-out state would need to comply with um, if they were to choose to build out the RAN on their own. So understanding what those are is another important element. We want to make sure all that is laid out in the first op operations and network policy section. And then lastly, the, the, the process, the, the governor's process, the governor's decision. So what does that process look like if they're to go the route of opt-in or do nothing, acceptance of the state plan, except, uh, essentially, or if you want to opt out, what does that process look like? What are those steps you would need to take? Uh, what things would need, to be, would need to be taken in place? We want to make sure all that is spelled out in advance so everyone can go look at this and make an informed decision going
going into it. That's ultimately the goal of the state plan. Um, and we uh, are, are definitely pushing to have this included not only in the final state plan, but in that draft state plan. We've talked about this notional draft state plan, pushing that out, socializing it with stakeholders, getting feedback, and ensuring we do that before we really finalize the state plan and deliver that to the governor. So you can see at a high level, that's kind of the organization of this information. As, as some of you may want to dig in and take a look, you'll see more details um, on it, but that is the way we've kind of organized and structured this. And then lastly, <clears throat> uh, you, you may have seen this, it's just a timeline and to reiterate the timeline of what we've done. So as mentioned, that timeline, uh, uh, you know, the, the very aggressive dates we've set for this acquisition of making an award in November um, ha have come and gone. We are still eagerly moving forward, as I mentioned. Um, but some of those key dates, we know that a lot of people are asking for of when will draft state plans be delivered? When will final state plans be delivered? All of that will be work, worked out and finalized upon award of the contract. It's, those are obviously key dates we need to set uh, with our eventual partner. And, and um, they will have made a commitment to those um, when we award the contract. The, the, the state plan tasking is included as day one task orders when we award the contract. So that means when we award the contract, the schedule associated with executing that work will, be, um, will start day one. We will know those dates upon the award of the contract. And we're committed to making sure that we push that information out as soon as we can, because we know how important it will be for planning purposes uh, post-award. So we wish we had dates for you, very exact dates, but I think it's important to understand the context and what we're kind of working towards um, and when we can make those available to you in, in a very um, concrete way. So that is all we had for our update. I think I will hand it over to one of my other colleagues, Adam Geiser, to give a quick tribal update, and then we will take questions. All right, thank you, Brian. Miya Yamachachi, Chutnom Adam Geisler, Nolanoi and I Bayom Kuwicham. Again, uh, my name is Adam Geisler, and uh, I'm also a resident of California and of uh, one of the tribal nations here, the La Jolla Band of Liseno Indians. And I've uh, worked with a number of you in the past, so it's good to be back. Um, I real quickly just want to just stop and say, um, again, congratulations um, to coming on board, Pat. Uh, it's been great to work with you in the past, and we're happy to see you now on the uh, OES side. So it's going to be fun, uh, fun path ahead. So I'm glad to see you here. Um, with regards to uh, the tribal update, um, a couple things that I wanted to point out. Um, we've been with the tribal team trying to educate and inform as much of Indian country as we can in the last year regarding the first net process in prepping tribes for the governor's decision process. Um, and some of those engagements have included working with some very technical groups that are out in Indian country, including the telecommunications and uh, energy, no, oh, excuse me, technology subcommittee for uh, the National Congress of American Indians. And we actually have a delegate in the room, Mr. Matt Rintanen, who uh, sits on, co-chairs that committee, as well as he's on the, uh, the uh, California, Tribal, California Tribal Advisory Committee and the California Broadband Council Tribal Advisory Committee as well as doing some work with the White House. So um, the point is, is that it, you'll see a lot of times in Indian country, a lot of the same people are out and about in, in these various spaces. So I'm happy to see um, the attendance here today, but I'm also excited because uh, what Matt was able to participate in it was, um, was an in-depth discussion about quality of service priority and preemption. And so we're using these national outlets in order to push this information so Indian country can better understand um, how quality of service priority and preemption um, will, will work within uh, tribal structures or how, uh, how they will work within how we're setting up FirstNet. Uh, so that was one thing that we had that we'd taken part in. Um, with regards to the process coming up, uh, really in the, in the next six months, um, in working through the California Tribal Advisory Committee and, um, and now the new uh, single point of contact with the state, uh, we're looking to schedule meetings with the Southern California Tribal Chairman's Association, um, uh, with uh, Chairman Smith, the Central California Tribal Chairman's Association, with Chairman Day from Tuolumne, um, the Northern California Tribal Chairman's uh, Association, um, with uh, Chairman Sunbury from Trinidad, as well as working through the Tribal Police of Ch uh, Chiefs of Police uh, here in California, uh, Mr. Bill Danke out of Saquon, um, and the uh, Tribal Fire Chiefs Association, Mr. Uh, or Chief Smith out of the Salmon Well Band. Uh, 
In addition to that, there's some other associations in the state that um, we're going to be pushing this, this information, this process out to. As you can see, there's a, there's a portal we're going to be launching. If, you've, if you're looking at the, the sheet that Brian just handed out, there is a tribal section. Clearly, this board um, has taken the time to understand the need to address those elements. We at FirstNet have also recognized that. So, um, so uh, Indian country is going to need to be aware of these. And so that's part of the intention as we go out in the next six months and educating and sharing the information and making sure that um, the tribes in the state and the associations know how to be working through the through the state to uh, to share and provide input uh, through your working group. So um, I'd also like to say that I'm a proud Californian and it's nice to see what California has done because this is a uh, not everybody has approached uh, taking a bite at this apple the same way, and I think that what you have laid out really seems to be a, a solid path for success in education um, and inclusion. Um, uh, lastly, uh, I do want to note that, oh, I, two other associations. Um, the United POMO, we're going to be trying to uh, get with uh, Chairman Hunter, and then also the Intertribal Council of California with uh, Connie Wright, Solis, as you guys have probably worked with in the past through OES. Um, to just make sure that we are basically getting all the information out to all the organizations, because as you mentioned before, California is complex with over 110 federally recognized tribes. Um, lastly, uh, one thing I wanted to note uh, that is different from the last time we had sat down is um, in addition to the advisory committee that there is here at CalFERN, uh, the Public Safety Advisory Committee for FirstNet actually has a tribal working group. And the delegate that has filled the um, Southern California Tribal Chairman's Association seat is, uh, is one of California's own Bob Clark. If you remember Bob, uh, he was uh, former chief of staff for the commissioner for California Highway Patrol. Uh, so we're really excited to have uh, Bob on board uh, at the working group. And uh, uh, you will more than likely be seeing, and the tribes in, this, uh, in the state of California will be seeing uh, a letter coming out from Bob and the other working group members regarding um, Better, uh, I, I'm hesitant to say the word data collection because that means so many different things. But really what we're trying to understand at FirstNet is um, profiles of public safety entities in Indian country uh, because there is not one mega database out there that exists. So if we can help to try to better understand the needs of Indian country uh, into the future and working with our partner, that's what we're going to be trying to do. Um, and hopefully that also makes your life easier too. So. Um, Okay, I thought I said something wrong. All right, <laughs> government affairs is, I'm just teasing you. Um, uh, other than that, uh, you know, we're looking forward to uh, an exciting new year uh, uh, as the state plans uh, continue to develop and we select our partner and uh, this portal comes out so everybody can finally see what we're all thinking. So other than that, uh, I'll turn the floor back over. Or Jeanette. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that next week is uh, FirstNet's board meeting, our quarterly board meeting. It'll be right here in Sacramento. So uh, Cal OES has been very gracious. Uh, Director Gilarducci will be addressing the board next week, Wednesday morning. And the board would also be taking a tour here of the Cal OES facilities next Tuesday afternoon. So thank you very much for accommodating our board. And we really appreciate it. Thank you again. Uh, thank you, Adam, for that overview. I think that's helpful to really think about FirstNet going out. Oftentimes, the tribal advisor or state agencies go out and address these groups, but I think them really getting um, the firsthand FirstNet touch and getting to ask specific questions will be really useful. I would also add to that group TASSEN because those that will um, pull together some of the Southern California tribes that don't participate in the Chairman's Association in that area. And then also, um, I would just uh, maybe send us a note if you want me to help push that out through my networks. That way we can help cover those folks who may not belong to any, any of the associations or those um, that may not be meeting regularly. Are there any other comments or discussions? Barry? Yeah, um, I have a, a comment, um, and, and it's not something I would expect FirstNet to be able to answer, but, but maybe just something I wanted to, to uh, throw out there. I, I don't know whether there has been any discussion or need for um, letter, this is with respect to the, the uh, 
the protest and and the the legal issues going forward with that but I don't know whether there's any uh, need for letters of support or uh, other materials uh, that could come from either states or local jurisdictions to, uh, to really demonstrate the urgent need to get a decision as quickly as possible. And um, I, I, I feel like that there would be agencies who would be willing to write letters or do other things like that um, if, if the need arises and, uh, or, or other types of communications. Uh, I just wanted to kind of raise that that point, and uh, please let us know if we if we can help. Because I, I, I personally I feel like it's really it, it time is of the es essence here, and until we get uh, a, the ability to have a decision on the vendor, we can't have state plans, we can't have governor decisions, we can't really do anything else. And so, um, to, to me, it's it's a pretty urgent to get get that resolved as quickly as possible. So I'll uh, just throw that out. Yeah, definitely appreciate the offer. Uh, I don't know, um, but we will, uh, if, if that is something that could be of value, we'll definitely let, let you guys know and appreciate that offer. Any other discussion, questions? All right, seeing none. Uh, Barry Frazier, Public Safety Advisory Committee update. Thank you, Chief. Um, so uh, as, as all of you on the board know, and most of you in the, of the public knows, I am uh, a member of FirstNet Public Safety Advisory Committee, and I have been asked to give sort of a standing update uh, at each of our meetings on the activities of the, uh, the PSAC. Uh, we, uh, the PSAC last met uh, on October 6th uh, via a, a webinar and teleconference, and um, we, um, we basically had a, a pretty robust discussion on of the status of all of our activities, and we got updates from FirstNet on the status of, of, of FirstNet uh, initiatives. I will note that that, that particular date, uh, many of the PSAC members were, were not able to attend because they were actively assisting with, uh, with Hurricane Matthew and the response efforts that were going on at that time. So we had a, small, a little bit of a smaller attendance for that one, but uh, for, for good reason. Um, Chief uh, Harlan McEwen, who is the PSAC chair, uh, made some announcements. He announced that, uh, that we have some new federal uh, partner, federal agency uh, partners uh, who are now represented on the PSAC, including Michael Gilmore, Gilmore from the FBI and the Department of Justice, uh, Mark Grubb from SafeCom, uh, Craig Moise from uh, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, um, uh, some of you may know some of these folks uh, that I've had a chance to meet all, all of them, and th they're uh, really good, strong representatives from the federal side. Um, the, um, the, the, well, there, there was also mention of uh, uh, FirstNet's new conference booth, which um, uh, some of you may have seen at some conferences uh, uh, around, the, uh, around the country. Uh, the, there uh, was a lot of... Uh, uh, pride in this new conference booth, and uh, folks are encouraged to go and visit FirstNet if they see the booth uh, when they're out uh, at conferences and other events. Uh, I know it was at the IACP in San Diego uh, recently, uh, so if you see that uh, that booth, please uh, stop by and, and say hi. Uh, the biggest news was that uh, the creation of a new task team uh, for the PSAC, which was it's titled the User Profiles Task Team. Uh, FirstNet asked for the PSAC's advice on um, basically how information about each user's roles and responsibilities uh, will get collected and input into the, uh, to, to the FirstNet system for the purposes of prioritization, um, preemption, and also for uh, user and device registration, provisioning, and managing um, identity and credentialing and access management. Uh, security, ICAM. Uh, so this task, I've been involved with this task team. The task has involved gathering what we call attribute, attributes, which are the information about various roles and responsibilities uh, for, for each user. Uh, these attributes from, from the four main public safety disciplines, uh, law, fire, EMS, and 911, and to create, using these attributes to create sort of a template for basically quickly and easily inputting information about users uh, um, that will go into the, to the FirstNet network. 
uh, to, 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 to determine priority uh, and, 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 you know, access to, to sensitive uh, materials and databases and those types of things. Uh, we've built on, on the work that we've done previously in the ICAM and local control task teams and also back with uh, the QPP tasking, which uh, was, we did some work here um, in California on QPP. Uh, we're, we're really pushing hard to get this all done. We're actually having our final meeting next week uh, in person as part of the, um, the PSAC meetings that will occur right after the, um, the board meeting, uh, the FirstNet board meeting. And uh, we're, we're trying to get all that uh, out. Uh, Chris Lombard from uh, Seattle Fire is the, uh, the chair, the head of that task team. Uh, the PSAC also heard uh, uh, report outs, reports from the early builder working group, the federal working group, and the tribal working group, which Adam already mentioned the tribal group. Uh, the, the, the tribal group has been ra ramping up and I, I think will be um, uh, much more, uh, uh, participate much more with the PSAC going forward. Um, they seem to have gotten a, a good group of people together to, to work on that, uh, that working group. Uh, the Early Builder Working Group uh, gave us updates. Uh, uh, Todd Early from uh, the Texas Project gave us an update on some of the uh, uh, the challenges and issues that are are uh, going on with uh, with those early projects. Uh, and he also specifically mentioned an interesting uh, ICAM proof of concept that is being um, piloted in Houston as part of the Texas Early Build Network, uh, which were uh, eager to find out some information about uh, the lessons learned and, and information about how, how, we, uh, how we ensure that, that users uh, get the right access and get the access that they, that they need but aren't, don't get access to information that they don't, they don't need or aren't authorized to use. Um, uh, as I said, the next meeting will be next week, uh, December 14th and 15th. Uh, it's an in-person meeting here in Sacramento. The uh, part of the meeting will be open to the public the afternoon of the 14th, um, and it's at the same location as the FirstNet board meeting, uh, meetings that are going on at the Double, I believe the Doubletree Hotel here in, in Sacramento. So uh, I think at 1.30 to 3.30 or something along that lo those lines, if you'd like to sit in and see the PSAC uh, in action, you're uh, certainly welcome to, to come and, uh, and see us at work. And I think that's uh, about it. I'll answer any questions if there are any. Otherwise, that's it. Questions, discussion for, for Barry? Yeah. We're really wowing him today. Yeah. <laughs> well done. All right, thanks so much, Barry. We really appreciate your, your work and your, and your update from there. Uh, our next item, item eight, is public comment. So this begins the session for anyone in the public who would like to comment. Looking at the public, <laughs> looking for comment. There is one, come on up. If you wouldn't mind uh, stating your name and uh, you have three minutes. Certainly, actually, um, I don't know if this is public comment, but uh, <laughs> I am uh, Rob Mayberry. Um, first of all, good morning board, guests and visitors. Um, I am a Cal OES uh, Public Information Officer. I'm also the uh, Public Information Officer, the lead Public Information Officer for the Public Safety Communications Branch. And I was asked to uh, come in today and just to report out on uh, the media interest that has been given to the, um, the request for information, the RFI. So that's what I'll do. So on the RFI, as it was mentioned, was released on November 11th. Um, it is currently on the state, uh, the Cal E procurement uh, website. Uh, we have received several calls um, regarding how to locate the, um, the, what has been posted, the RFI, and um, we've directed them to that. So uh, to date, we have received four media inquiries, uh, the Wall Street Journal, Urgent Communications, which is a trade publication, uh, TR Daily, which is a telecom trade publication, and Communications Daily, which is a telecom newsletter based out of Washington, D.C. Uh, the sentiment, sentiment uh, of these inquiries has been neither negative, positive, but neutral. Basically, why the RFI? And um, it was determined that we would issue a statement in response to all these inquiries. 
Uh, so we drafted a statement. It was reviewed and approved by um, your Deputy Director of Public Safety Communications, Mick Migdovich, uh, Deputy, Deputy, Deputy Director of Public Information and Media Relations, Kelly Houston, Cal OES Chief Deputy Director, Nancy Ward, and Cal OES Director, Mark Gellarducci. So at this time, I'll go ahead and read the statement. And the statement reads, the California Office of Emergency Services, Cal OES, has recently released a request for information in an effort to obtain as much information as possible for available options for building out California's radio access network. Cal OES is working with California First Responder Network, Board of Directors, the State Advisory Committees, and FirstNet to make certain California's needs are met. We continually, continually look for ways that improve first responder communication systems to ensure that people in emergency situations can communicate to emergency responders in a safe and timely manner. Working in concert with other public safety agencies in the state, Cal OES is dedicated to providing the best emergency services possible. Modifications or refinements are continually being made to California's emergency communication system in order to keep up with today's ever-changing technology. And that appears to have satisfied the inquiries from the media outlets. So um, with that, I will have copies available if you would like them. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Any other comments from the public? All right. Seeing none, we'll move on to the last item, which is adjournment. But before we do that, I had asked Sue a question about our next, uh, our next meeting location. Right. I, I believe back in August, we just had the discussion of alternating between Northern California and Southern California. Um, so we're open. We're more than happy to host the February uh, 2017 meeting, which will be our first CalFriend board meeting of 2017 here. Um, so it's up for discussion. And I guess the only, uh, the only recollection, the reason I asked Sue was, um, was to try to uh, spread the access a little bit better for uh, people who are continually having to travel uh, from Southern California to attend our board meetings to, to try to share the pain. And, and well, you're, you're more than welcome to have it in Los Angeles, you know, it, on alternating meetings if you'd like. We'd be more than happy to host it down there, but uh, it's, you know. Okay. I mean, I've okay, the only one that travels. <laughs> <laughs> now. Yeah. Uh, does anybody have any, any particular preferences? I mean, I, there, there's no reason um, that we can't keep them all here, but that was just the part of the discussion that I remembered was uh, creating uh, a little bit of, of equal access. So, thoughts? I would just add, uh, and I'm from Humboldt County originally, so when you say Northern California for Sacramento, I go, hmm. So I would just say that I'm, I'm open to the alternating, and if I can't make it personally, I know there's always the WebEx uh, option, but as Adam's going out to Northern California, Tribal's, uh, Chairman's Association, remember that it's a five-hour drive to here from those areas, which they do regularly and oftentimes uh, to even catch good flights. But to go to uh, Southern California would be definitely a plane ride or a 9 to 11 hour drive. So just to be aware of Northern, we're Northern-ish here. Good point. Very good. Um, so we'll have the meeting in February. Here yeah, we'll, go that, that sounds good. We'll, we'll do the February meeting here in Sacramento. And uh, if perhaps the board could consider uh, what it would like to do moving forward, and we can take some formal action at the February meeting, just so people can expect uh, when and where to find us. So, um, absent anything else, I would entertain. Oh, there's something else. I, uh, I had just one thought. Uh, getting back to the, uh, the 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 working group task that we discussed earlier, uh, the California Fern Board also has a technical advisory committee, and. Um, uh, Pat and I had a, a brief discussion that we also need to get that that technical advisory committee involved in in some of this uh, discussion and evaluation. They can, I think, uh, um, be very helpful to us in uh, in some of the more um, complex technical issues that we'll be dealing with as a part of these evaluations. So I just wanted to mention that uh, that um, 
the, the technical advisory committee can be on notice as well that they may have some work going their way very very shortly. That's great, and it makes makes total sense to involve them. Piling it higher and deeper, I think you said. <laughs> uh, if, is there anything else from the group? Announcements or anything people like to share? All right, seeing none, I would accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. All right, is there a second? Second. Thank you, Paul. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? Seeing none. Thank you all for uh, spending some time with us today. And uh, happy holidays, happy new year. We'll see you in February.